So let me ask you if this has ever happened to you. Have you ever been on a website searching for something and you got carried away with the filters? You know, like if you're on Amazon and everybody shops on Amazon, right? There are two kinds of people in the world, people who shop on Amazon and people who have rotary dial phones. Okay, and, and I can say that because we until recently had a rotary dial phone. We never used it uh, because you couldn't use it anymore. But I kept it and just would take it out every now and then and look at it and remember those good old days when I owned a phone and the phone didn't own me. That was, that's, that's another sermon for another day. But, but you get on Amazon, or I was on Travelocity a while back, and this happened to me. Uh, you know, they have the filters down the left side, just like Amazon does. And we were looking, it's actually been longer than that, because we were looking for a place to stay in Nashville. We were going over for a concert, so it's been over a year ago. But I was looking for a, an inexpensive hotel room in Nashville. <laughs> Good luck with that if you've ever tried to do that. There are no inexpensive. There are cheap hotel rooms in Nashville, but there are no inexpensive hotel rooms in Nashville, if you know what I mean. So we were looking for someplace downtown near the Gaylord Arena. So here here we go, you know. Okay, I want this many stars, but I only want this much in price. And it needs to be located in a certain place. And need to have breakfast. And not just any breakfast. Want those pancakes. And the pancakes really be cool if they look like Mickey Mouse, if possible. They'd be good. I want pure maple syrup and I want the link sausage not the sausage patties okay and on on and on it's this filter and that filter I finally got it all set and I hit search and the thing whirred and clanged for a minute smoke started coming out of my computer and finally this message popped up and said just stay home you're too picky that's all I got ever happened to you? You can filter yourself out of of, of a search option. I was trying to buy some shoes on Amazon once, you know, and put so many filters on it that nothing came up. There was no such thing. And this week I started thinking, as I thought about the sermon, I started thinking, you know what? I do that, and maybe you do too. Maybe sometimes we do that with people, and we start filtering, and we start filtering people out. And I'm going to make a confession right now. Uh, right after 9-11, I have to confess to you that I adopted a filter against anybody who even remotely looked like they might have come from the Middle East. And a lot of people did too. And I hung out with that for a while until I started seeing stories in the news. In particular, there was this man in Dallas. This was four or five days after 9-11. So it was in, in when, when that was, 10, how long ago has that been? 20 years ago? Almost. So... So he, he killed two people, two people who ran convenience markets. One of them was Pakistani-American. One of them was Indian. Now, the, the hijackers were from the, uh, either Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, or Lebanon. So these people weren't from those countries, but they probably had skin color or facial features or whatever that maybe suggested that they're from the Middle East or they're Muslim. And so just killed them. And there were all sorts of stories of people's stores being burned down and people being harassed. Some, some were people whose parents were from somewhere in the Middle East, but, but they were born here or U.S. citizens had never even been over there. And yet they're being harassed. And that really made an impression on me. And I had to get serious with Jesus about that and had to work on kind of taking that filter away because I realized that's, that's just wrong and it's certainly not fair. Has is that, is that ever happened to you? You know, the fact of the matter is it's human nature. Now, it doesn't excuse it, but, but we are only human and we're always afraid of what we don't understand. And when we don't understand people, sometimes we act out against them because we don't understand them. Um, and so with all that in mind, uh, we continue our sermon series today called Come Together at, uh, as One at the Cross. Now, We've talked about how we can come together when our brokenness and we come to the cross and Jesus starts knitting our brokenness back together. We've looked how we serve at the cross. But today we're going to look in particular about how we are one people at the cross. Uh, you got to remember when, when Jesus was on the cross, that, his invitation to come to the cross for healing, for salvation, all that was open to everybody who would reach back to him. Everybody. But, and, and the first thing I want to say this morning is that Jesus 
died just as he lived, and that is with no filter. Jesus had no filters. Everyone was welcome at the cross, and that's what he calls us to do. So I want to focus on this passage for a minute. We're going to get to the one that the song was about, John 3.16. I want to read uh, some verses that lead up to it just to set the context and make a comment or two about it. Uh, but, but I want to take this verse that many of us learned in uh, vacation Bible school or maybe from a, from a grandma or grandpa or a mom or dad or something uh, and, and see if we can expand it a little bit, expand the meaning of it this morning. Because there's really good news in all this if, we'll, if we're willing to do what we're supposed to be doing during this time of Lent leading up to Easter and that's looking inside and evaluating the things that we need to hand over to Jesus. And maybe, maybe we need to hand our filters over to him. Let's talk about it. Okay, here we go. John 3, verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to add 16. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. Now, pause right there for just a second. You got to remember, John's gospel is full of code. It's on different layers. And so whenever John says uh, that he came at night, uh, it may have been at night, but, but what he is really wanting us to understand is he came in spiritual darkness. And as a Pharisee, this is one of the spiritual leaders. This is one of the, the ruling council that Jesus was in constant conflict with because, quite frankly, they were scared of him because he was amassing a crowd. Uh, they were scared of his teaching because, as many said, he taught with authority, and it just freaked him out. And so they, they opposed him every chance they could. But this one Pharisee, this Nicodemus guy, he realized there was something in Jesus that no one else had. And he said, we, we realize you're a man from God, but I need to talk to you about that. So this Pharisee, who by the way, Pharisees were notorious for their filters because they thought they were all that and a bag of chips because they knew the Bible better. And the Bible, meant, of course, in those days was what we know as the Old Testament. That was the Hebrew Bible. They knew it better than anybody and they tried to keep the law meticulously and they looked down their nose at people who didn't. So, so, okay, that's who Nicodemus was, and that's this deal about coming in the dark. And so Jesus replied and says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, that's, that's one sentence, but it's huge. This kingdom of God, that's what Jesus came to do, was to kind of lay out the contours of what this coming kingdom was going to look like. It's not going to get here fully until Jesus says game over and he comes back at the end of the age, whenever that is. I don't know. But that's the kingdom that he's talking about. And this born again thing, that gets shrunk down so small. Hang on to that. So Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. And I can see, Je I can see Jesus just rolling his eyes and going, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. When he talks about the water and the spirit, he's talking about the waters of the womb. We have to be born physically. But then he says to be born again means that you are reborn spiritually by reaching to Jesus, by placing our trust in him. Then the Holy Spirit comes on board and gets active within us to make us a little less like our old selves and a little more like Jesus. And then we get to 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. And you know, so many times that passage gets reduced to getting to heaven. Now, hallelujah, because of Jesus, I'm going to go to heaven and I hope you are too, because that's based on faith in Christ, period, okay? There's nothing we can do to add to that. And that's wonderful. And that's part of what this is all about. But see, Jesus is trying to get people to get involved in his kingdom work here on this side of the Jordan River before we go to heaven. And this part of being born again, being born in the spirit is allowing us to be able to start seeing the kingdom as he saw it. Because he saw it all around when he was preaching and teaching and healing, connecting with people, striking relationships with people that nobody else would. See, he was, he was seeing the kingdom because he was looking out of kingdom eyes. He wants us to look out of kingdom eyes. Because see, there's this beautiful image of being born again. Think about, think about when we're, when, but right before we're born, where are we? Well, we're in the womb and it's a tiny, you know, 
tight quarters for sure, but it's a beautiful place to be nurtured until we're ready, until our bodies are physically ready to be born. But after that then, we have to be born because we cannot grow anymore. And so part of being born again means getting out of this this cramped space that sometimes our hearts and minds can live in, getting out of that so that we can open up and begin to embrace more and more of the world. And then what else happens whenever we're born? When we're born, we open our eyes and we can suddenly see outside for the first time. I think that's another beautiful image that goes along with this idea of being born again. Suddenly we have room to move around spiritually thinking and we can and we can see out of these eyes that he has given us spiritually speaking to see the kingdom as it's unfolding around us. So so much more than simply going to heaven, which is wonderful, not taken away from that, but boy, we got a lot of living to do before then. Being born again means becoming part of a movement that creates a little heaven right here on earth. That's what Jesus did with his healing, as I mentioned, with healing, teaching, and preaching. He was creating these little glimpses of heaven, and he wants us to do the same thing. Now, what does that look like? Well, this this last word that I want to lift up of John 3 16 and that is for God so loved the world world and that gets kicked around sometimes and there are lots of different ways to interpret it John again John's gospel operates on different levels and and some people look at it as meaning the created order you know the planet the moon the stars the sky the, the ocean the mountains and that's one way to look at it. World also was used occasionally by Jesus to talk about, about people who were opposed to God and God's coming kingdom. But in this case, and in most cases, world, world is very relational, and it has to do with people. And to kind of put it in a nutshell, when Jesus says God so loved the world, he's saying God so loved every single human being on the planet. He loved them so much that he gave his son so that they could live forever and experience this wonderful eternal life, both now while we're you know, breathing on this, side of the, on this side of the Jordan River and one day whenever we go on to heaven. World is huge. Let me give you an idea of maybe what Jesus had in mind when he was thinking about all these people that he called to the cross, all these people that he said would be drawn to him if he were lifted up. This is from the book of Revelation, a couple of verses. And you know, people hear that word and they go, oh no, he's going to read from Revelation. Oh no, there's all sorts of bad stuff in there. No, there isn't. Actually, Revelation is good news. It means Jesus wins and the devil loses. That's, that's the headline from Revelation. But John that wrote Revelation, he has this vision he has this vision of heaven. And let me read some of it. If you ever wonder what heaven looks like, well, this is, this is from the Bible, from Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what heaven looks like. It looks like a cross-section of the world. It's every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, all together worshiping God. No filter at all. That's the scene we get from heaven. And it's no wonder that Jesus lived the way he did here after coming from there. How did he live here? He, welcomed, he, he, would, he would hang with anybody. You know, I mean, here he, he hung out with the Jews. He even hang out with the Jewish ruling council, the ones that were always after him. He would engage them because he was trying to, he was trying to get them to see the kingdom as well. But he hung out with Samaritans for heaven's sake. And Jews hated Samaritans. Not only that, but a female Samaritan. And I'm sorry, ladies, and I'm, we're, we're working to try to make this not so anymore in the world. But in those days, in those days, women didn't get a lot of respect from anybody. And for an adult uh, Jewish male, particularly a, a rabbi, someone identified as a rabbi, to be speaking in public to a Samaritan woman, I'm sure the disciples on that day were going like, Jesus, what are you thinking? But Jesus is like, I'm, I'm thinking about this woman here that needs me, you know? So the Samaritans, demon-possessed, he hung out with them. He hung out with tax collectors. He hung out with adulterers. He hung out with all sorts of sinners. He hung out with Canaanites and Jebusites and 
mosquito bites and all those ites and all those people that we call Gentiles of the capital G, those are all the people that weren't Jewish and there were lots of different ones. He hung out with them. He healed them on occasion. Even Roman citizens, a Roman soldier once, he healed a servant. You know, so my point is that he just lived down here the way it was up there where it's just people. It's not these people or those people. It's just, it's just people. And that something that, that that's what it's like up there. And it's so much bigger. There's so, you know, because there's so much to learn from people from other cultures. They can learn from us. We can learn from them if we're willing to turn our filter off for a minute. Jesus came to establish kingdom values that value everyone. No one gets left out. Everyone has the chance to be who they are in front of Jesus. Now, let me talk about filters in another way for just a second. Uh, maybe you use a photo app, an editing app, or maybe you do this on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you use the filters, you take a picture, and you've got this picture, whatever it is, and so you, you start using filters, and one of them turns it a little bit orange, and one of them turns it a little bit pink or magenta, and one gives it film grain, and one makes it black and white or whatever. You can do all these different things with these filters, and you can take the original and make it look like whatever you want it to look like. And we do that with people. We take our filter. In my case, back then, I'm better. I, I, I really am. I promise I'm better. But back then, whenever, whenever I was just holding a grudge against anybody from the Middle East after 9-11 because I was so angry, I took a filter that just took everyone who may have even remotely looked like that and just colored them ugly, mean, terrorist, you know, to be suspicious of. And I slap that filter on everybody. That's not fair. It's no more fair than it would have been if people had slapped one on me whenever back, uh, remember the Oak, some of you don't, some, many of you do. You can go back and Google it. The Oklahoma City bombing, remember that? That was before 9-11 by a few years. And that was, until 9-11, the worst case of terrorism within our borders up to that point. Where hundreds of people died in that bombing. Perpetrated by a white male who had been honorably discharged from the army. And I, you know, I started thinking, I, I would hate for people to slap that filter on all white males and suddenly I'm a terrorist because a white male blew up a building, you know? And, and I started making connections and I realized I've, I, can't, I can't think this way anymore. I can't think this way and expect to stand under the banner of Jesus, you know? I mean, I can do it. It's a free country. And if I want to think that way, I can but Jesus is going to take a dim view of it. And you know why? Have you ever been talking to someone and maybe you had a mutual friend and they started talking about them in a way that was disparaging, throwing a little shade? Have you heard so-and-so did this or so-and-so that or blah, blah, blah? And, they're, and, and this person may know them but doesn't really hang with them, but you do? And you're thinking, you know, you're thinking, whoa, whoa. It, well, this is my friend. Please don't talk about her. Don't talk about him that way. Has that ever happened to you? It's uncomfortable, isn't it? And it occurred to me this week, back when I was, when I was just taking all people from the Middle East and, and treating them that way, you know, Jesus, Jesus was going, whoa, trotter, whoa. I died for those people too. And they have just as much right to reach toward me on the cross as, as you do. Don't, don't talk about them like that. And, and it was that filter that was in me that Jesus was like, oh, okay, I see what the problem is. We got to get rid of that filter. And you never know if those filters may be lurking. This story, this just comes from a week ago, and, and many of you probably know this story, and I'm, I'm going to spare the details because I, I don't want to say the words. But it was out in Oklahoma. There, there was a high school basketball game. And there was this guy who had a little network and, and he would broadcast the games over the internet so that people could, you know, watch their kids, their grandkids or whatever, play ball. And these two girls' high school basketball teams were about to play. And one of the teams chose to kneel during the national anthem. And I understand that 
that, that made, just saying that made some of you uncomfortable. And I get that. And we're not going to talk about that this morning. It's not what this sermon's about. Just part of the story, okay? So, so relax. I understand we have different views of that in this room. And I respect everybody in this room, okay? So let's, let's let that go. But it is important to the story. And so while that was happening, this guy, this broadcaster, <clears throat> who didn't realize his microphone was on, he uses a word for these girls, the ugliest word that can be used toward African Americans, and prefaced it with the most vulgar word, in my opinion, that gets used today. And I, and I apologize for those of you who've read the story, and, and, I, and you just heard those words in your mind. I'm, I apologize for that. But he said that for all to hear on his network. This was, a, this was a high school team. These were 15, 16, 17-year-old girls. And that's what he called them. Now, he said that he's diabetic and his blood sugar was out of whack and he was disoriented. And that's why I said it. And I'm, I can't judge. I wasn't there. I'm not him. I don't know. But I do know this. Clearly, that th way of thinking, that filter was in there. I don't know what caused it to come out, but it was in there. And again, I start thinking, what's in me? Do I have any of those filters in me? Oh, I hope not. And so I've been praying a lot about it. Don't think I do anymore, but I'm not going to take it for granted. Because see, Jesus, he has saved you and me, and he saves everybody for heaven. Yeah. But he also saves us to help him bring about more and more and more of these little kingdom moments on the earth. See, Jesus, Jesus changes us to change the world. Not just so we can walk around and go, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, I'm all that. He changes us to change the world and he's counting on us. Now, how do we do that? Well, it may be just as simple. It may be just as simple as if you get in a conversation and it starts to go in that direction and some group is being pulled up out of thin air and filters start being applied, you know, you can just not participate. Or you can say, you know, if you do know someone, and I've done this before, uh, I did it with a, with a Hispanic person, a Latino person actually, and I said, well, I, you know, I know, I know this guy who's Latino and he's not like that at all. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. You, we have opportunities to do that, and, and Jesus would be really, really proud of us whenever we do that, or at least just not participate in those conversations. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't bad people in the world that we shouldn't be aware. There are bad white people and bad black people and bad Latinos and bad Mexicans and bad Buddhists and bad Muslims. I mean, there are bad people all over the world. But we can't take one and then just and, and extrapolate that to an entire race of people. I and mean, that's not fair any more than I want somebody doing that to me because I'm a white male. And white males make a lot of trouble, you know. And, so, and Jesus tells us we need to be wise as servants and gentle as doves as we go through life. And so we have to be aware. We have to protect ourselves and protect our families. And I'm not saying that there aren't any bad people in the world. I'm just saying nobody's got a corner on that. No one race, no one creed, no one color, no one language has a corner on that. Everybody's got their bad apples. So, okay. We got to be careful about filters. What, how, how, do we, how do we take that home? How do we live with that? I need you to help me. And I understand that we're not supposed to sing with masks on. I got that. And we do want to be careful because that is a way it's, I've seen the films of that and it does, you can, stuff goes flying everywhere when we sing. You can you, you sweat up here after service, but, but you can sing softly and you can help me. Need your help with the song. Everybody knows this song. He's got the whole world in his hands. Come on, he got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole, come on you. In his hands, he's got the whole world. And we love that verse that says, he's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got the little bitty babies. In his hands, got the whole world. I wrote some more verses. He got the black folk and the white folk. 
in his hands. He's got the Asians and Latinos in his hands. Come on, got the Mexicans and Arabs in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Yes, he's got the Muslims and the Buddhists in his hands. He's got the Christians and the Jews in his hands. He's got the Methodists and Baptists in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. One more. He's got the Democrats and Republicans in his hands. He's got the mask wearers and no mask wearers in his hands. He's got the COVID shots and no COVID shots in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Just remember that when Jesus spread his hands out on the cross, he was opening up to everybody and everybody has the chance to reach back and say, yes, Jesus. And he's counting on us to make sure that when people see us, they understand that, that they are welcome. I mean, considering everything that he's done for us, I think trying to get rid of filters is probably not too much to ask. Amen? Amen. Can we pray? Lord God, thank you for Thank you for not filtering me out. Thank you for not filtering my friends out. Thank you for not filtering us out, Lord, but in inviting us into your presence. We're so grateful for that. Um, we, we have a lot of work to do, but Lord, we are committed. We are committed today to living life with no filter so that we can uh, continue your kingdom building process and, and maybe just help you invite some more people to the cross, to receive your healing mercy, to receive that salvation that changes us so that you can change the world. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.